This uh, this sound will bring back some memories. This first sound, Gary. Bienvenue, Kanichiwa. It's time for the Armist Inquisition yet again. Episode uh, 147 on Sunday, the 30th of August. I'm Armish Phil. I'm Armish Ben. And I'm Armish Matt. And uh, tonight's guest is an award winning travel blogger, journalist, and photographer. Uh, he's the man behind everythingeverywhere.com and the host of his podcast, Everything Everywhere Daily. Links, as usual, will be in the descriptions. Uh, the episode descriptions for all that. So, uh, Gary Arndt, welcome to the show. Thanks. Uh, one small correction. My website is everything-everywhere.com, which yeah. is important because, as you're British, you know, there was a phone company called Everything Everywhere. And they had the non-dash version of the domain name. And I remember <laughs> this was in 2010 when Orange and T-Mobile announced they were going to merge. I got about a hundred emails. I was walking around bars. Oh, you're going to be so rich. They're going to buy you out. And nothing ever happened. Uh, I looked into it with like an intellectual property attorney. And basically it's like, well, they're in a different business in a different country. There's nothing you can do. And then they stopped using it. So. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. <laughs> so at least I know what EE stands for now. Yeah. That, that's what it is. Uh, I'm waiting for the day they forget to uh, renew their domain. And I'm going to take it. <laughs> I had a lot of people like linking to my website and visiting me all of a sudden and the number of searches. I, I had people leaving nasty <laughs> messages on my Facebook page complaining about the service. And I was like, <laughs> not, not me. It's not a phone company. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, I was reading your, your bio earlier off, off your website and you sound a bit like a modern day Herodotus <laughs> traveling the world and reporting on what's going on. Yeah, so uh, what happened is I, I had an internet company in the 90s, and I sold it before the dot-com bubble burst. Uh, I went back to school, did some other things, started some other businesses, didn't know what to do. Then I came up with the idea of uh, selling my house and traveling around the world for a year. And one year kind of turned into 13, and I just kind of never stopped. And uh, so, yeah, when I started, I, I had a website, and I just started posting a lot of my thoughts about the places I was visiting. And when I started, I also went to a lot of weird places. So when a lot of people travel around the world, they kind of have a, you know, it's, it's major cities. They go to Sydney, Bangkok, Hong Kong, you know, London, Los Angeles, major cities of the world. And I was going, it took me six months to cross the Pacific Ocean. I was going to Tonga, Samoa, uh, you know, Vanuatu, places like that. And I think that kind of uh, got me a following. And then I just sort of never stopped. I just kind of kept going. Yeah, it's um, something a lot of people dream of, isn't it? Sort of leaving the rat race behind and um, living life on their own terms. It's um, something that a lot of people dream about and they never really realize that dream. More people are doing it. Uh, there's been a huge change since when I started. When I started, I could tell you like most of the people that were doing what I was doing because there weren't many. And then it just exploded. And now, you know, there are so many things, so many jobs that you can do anywhere. And a lot of this is, you know, the, the pandemic has caused a lot of people to kind of wake up to this. You know, why am I paying high rents in places like San Francisco, New York, or London when the amount of money I make is not dependent upon where I live and I can make a lot more money if I spend less on rent and food by living somewhere else. And I think you're going to see a lot more people that maybe take, you know, six months to a year and go live somewhere. And a lot of countries are wising up to this fact and they're offering visas now. So I think Estonia, Georgia, and Barbados, uh, you can now basically show up for a full year and just live there if you want. Right, without getting a, 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 like a work visa or a permit system, was it before? Yeah, except you're not working there. So the problem that most countries have is they don't want someone coming in and then taking jobs from locals. But if you're working online, 
then you're not taking anyone's job. You're just pumping money into the economy and you're just like a long-term tourist. And I think that's what a lot of countries are waking up to and why they're more open to this now. It's funny. You're talking about the sort of um, people living either in or within striking distance of all the major cities. There's been a, um, a major infrastructure project in this country called HS2, um, high speed rail, which has been rumbling along for about the last decade. And it's to do with high speed rail between uh, joining up London and Birmingham. And uh, you wonder why, the, why they're even bothering now, because so many people are, like say, are working online and with things like Zoom. You wonder if this thing's going to be redundant before they've even cut the ribbon and opened it. I still think, I mean, for a place like England, you're, you know, what's the train time from, you know, Birmingham to London now? A couple hours? Yeah, I yeah, think so. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's what people are commuting, you know, in the U.S. by car in some places. It's a bit ridiculous, but I think in the, in the case of the U.K., you have one city that just overwhelms, you know, it's the cultural, economic, and political capital. Um, so it probably is more important to have easy access to as much of the country as possible. In the U.S., we're way bigger, uh, and those things are all divided up. So we have you know, New York, which is kind of the finance capital. We've got Washington, which is a political capital. We have uh, a technical capital kind of in San Francisco. We have a cultural one sort of in Los Angeles, and, and things split up. So uh, it's maybe not as important. That's an interesting point. I, that never occurred to me before that other countries are different to us. In, <laughs> well, obviously, they're different, but just in the in the geography and the way that they're laid out, because you could you could make the same argument with Germany. You know, you've got um, what's the it's um, f -f -f the main financial center, Frankfurt. It's Frankfurt, yeah, it's not right. the capital. Yeah, um, different different countries are are weird that way. Like Paris is pretty much the city in France. You know, everything is centered around Paris. Germany is not that way. Um, Italy does not have a single. You know, uh, Milan is kind of you know important for fashion and a lot of business, and you'll find that in northern Italy, whereas Rome is the political and you know obviously the Vatican historical capital. Um, yeah, there's there's actually kind of a an academic field that kind of is around this where you have one dominant city in a country right i mean to me it sounds like we're just putting all our eggs in one basket really and, and there is a a bit of um you know grumbling and not dissent towards london but there's a there's a bit of bad feeling towards the fact that that everything is focused around london especially up up in the north where we are they talk of a, a like a north south divide um I wouldn't say it's as bad as all that, but there's definitely some, envy. some benefit. Yeah, some envy. I'd say there's some benefit to having these these multi uh, multiple areas of uh, you know of capitals for for different um, you know areas of society, really, rather than having everything in in one place. Yeah, yeah I think a lot of these things happen organically, uh, and in the case, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that one, you're an island. And two, it's, it's, you know, geographically not that large. So it's kind of easy for one place to die. I, I probably wasn't as, as big, say, in the 19th century when you had uh, places like, you know, uh, a Manchester, uh, which was like an industrial center uh, mm -hmm. that didn't really exist in London. Uh, but as things have, you know, into the 20th century, it's probably gotten more concentrated around London. Mm. Yeah, well, we're, we're in Preston, and that was huge for the cotton industry back in those days in the Victorian era. Um, but obviously in, in recent history, all those industrial heartlands have, have sort of died away. And well, the whole, the way we live and our society has changed it, it, you know, immensely since that time and things move on and you've got to move with the times or- Get left behind. You'll get left behind, yeah. But it, it's true in a lot of places, you know, everyone in, I won't say everyone, but a lot of people in the US, just as a general rule, hate people from New York. <laughs> and in Canada, everybody hates Toronto. And I think this is something that you see in a lot of places where either you're from the city or you're not. And if you're from that city, you look down on everyone else because, you know, you obviously live there. Everyone in New York thinks that they're great. I remember when I was at university, there was this one girl who was from New York and, and everything, the water was better in New York. The cookies were better in New York. The pizza was better in New York. And we're just like, well, why the hell did you leave? It's so great. <laughs> 
and everyone else who, if you're not from there, thinks the people who are there are assholes. So <laughs> I think it's kind of universal. I've seen it all over the world. Yeah. Wow. Um, you were talking earlier about, you know, when you first started traveling, that you were going to places sort of off the beaten track. What are, what are some of like the, the hidden gems that you found that a lot of people maybe aren't familiar with? Oh, there's so many. Uh, one of the things that I always hammer home is that uh, over tourism has had become a big problem. Well, prior to the pandemic, now it's not. But uh, everybody visits the same place. So you go to a place like Venice and it's just packed with people. But you go 20 minutes outside of Venice. I mean, you literally can get on a train in Venice and be in Padua 20 minutes later. There's nobody there. And it, it's a fantastic city to visit. You know, I think it's like 90% of the visitors to the UK go to London and then they never leave. They don't visit anywhere else. And uh, there are a lot of fantastic uh, places like that around the world. One of the best national parks I've ever been to is Nahani National Park, which I'm guessing you've never even heard of. And that is in Northern Canada. And the reason I mean, most Canadians have never heard of it. And the reason is because it gets 800 visitors a year. There are no roads connecting the park to the outside world, yet it's absolutely amazing. It's one of the largest waterfalls in the world in, um, in terms of volume. It is, has spectacular canyons, amazing mountains, uh, real Lord of the Rings type stuff when you're there. <laughs> and it, it's completely unknown to most people. And there's a lot of places like that. Um, we, you know, cruise ships are responsible for a lot of the over-tourism because they're visiting places that have ports. Yeah. And as a general rule, not universal, uh, but if, if, if there's not an international airport or a cruise terminal, a lot of people just don't visit. So, you know, I remember going through the Czech Republic and everybody goes to Prague. Fine city, nothing against Prague, except that there's just a ton of people there. But if you go outside of Prague and you go to, you know, even Chesky Krumlov is, is kind of uh, getting real popular, but there's a lot of other great towns that just don't get the tourists. And I think it's a matter of just kind of going to those places and being a bit more adventurous. Right. When, when you set off, say you were going to a country that you hadn't visited before, would you do your research before and sort of try and find these places that are, are relatively unknown? Or would you literally just go and then when you get there, think, right, I'm going to go? What I now? just go. Yeah. I mean, I might do a little bit of research, but for the most part, you show up and you talk to people. And, you know, I don't stay at really expensive hotels or anything because I, I think it's a waste of money to be spending you know, a lot in a place that we're going to spend most of your time unconscious. So, you know, what's the point? And when you stay at nicer hotels, you tend to meet fewer people. If you're staying at a hostel or something, you're going to spend less money and you're also going to be talking to people and you're going to be meeting people who are traveling who are probably just where you're going to go. And so they'll probably have the best advice as to the conditions at that moment. And they'll also be able to tell you, Oh yeah, you should go see this thing and this thing. And, um, uh, yeah, one of my one of my adages is, you know, the ability to adapt is always more important than the ability to plan. My plan when I started traveling was go west. And that was it. I was just, you know, I I, I literally took a train to Los Angeles, which was horrible. Don't don't ever take a train in the United States. It's a <laughs> horrible experience. I went to Hawaii and then from there I went to Tahiti, Easter Island, uh the Cook Islands, New Zealand, Tonga, Samoa, Fiji, and I just sort of did some island hopping through the region. And it was very difficult to even make a plan because in the guidebooks, some of the airlines that were listed went out of business. Uh, routes were changing all the time. So I really kind of had to make it up as I was going along. Wow. Thank you. Have you been, um, wait, I mean, You've been to England, I, I imagine, and you oh, said yeah. earlier about um, most people just going to London. Where, where did you go when you came over here? I usually end up going to England about once a year. So the, what I've done is that at, there's, there's a big event called World Travel Market in London at the Excel Center. So what I would do for years is take a side trip somewhere in England, and I've been kind of just working on uh, bits and pieces. So I went to Cornwall, I went down to Devon. Um, I went to Canterbury, Bath, uh, Liverpool, like that. So the, the, the kind of the next place I'm going to be going is sort of Northern England and the Midlands. That's sort of the next place. Uh, the, the Lake District I haven't been to. Um, 
and yeah. a lot of the, the the cities kind of up there. So that's sort of the next place. You'll have to uh, let us know when you when you're over. You can come in for a cup of tea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. I mean, I, it's really weird. I've done a, several podcast interviews in the last month, and I think uh, three of them have been with podcasts out of people in Northern England. Wow. And I don't know what's in the water there, or, or more likely the beer. But <laughs> <laughs> It's the black sheep. Black sheep <laughs> ale, I, think. Uh, I can definitely recommend the Lake District. It's one of my favorite mm. places to go. We, go, we, go, we take a vacation there near enough every year. It's a beautiful place to, to visit. And Northumbria as well. You've never been that far up. Really nice place to go. Yeah, maybe yeah, not. I've been to, I was in Scotland briefly, and I sort of kind of just jumped over it. Um, <laughs> yeah. But actually, when, when I did that, I was doing a trip where I, I went from the Isle of Man. Uh, I flew to Glasgow. And this was my first introduction to how weird British currency is because <laughs> I went to an ATM machine on the Isle of Man. I took out 200 pounds. Didn't even think about it. Put it in my wallet. Didn't look at it. I go to Glasgow and I was going to a movie theater and I take out a 20 pound note and they say, we can't accept this. And I go, well, why not? <laughs> and then I looked at it and it was an Isle of Man 20 pound note, <laughs> which I guess is a different thing. And then I learned that they don't even accept Scottish notes in England or sometimes <laughs> Northern Ireland. So what I've begun doing is I've been to like most of the British territory. So I've been to St. Helena, I've been to the Falklands, I've been to Gibraltar. And they all have their own currency. And I've been collecting uh, various like five, 10 pound notes from these places. And what I want to do is I want to record a video for YouTube in England at some point where I go to a pub or something and I try paying <laughs> and I'm going to go through an Isle of Man, Gibraltar, Falkland Islands, St. Helena, uh, <laughs> Scottish, every pound note I can, I am just going to have a ton of them in my wallet and get them all rejected before finally <laughs> going to a Bank of England one. <laughs> It's quite a strange uh, thing that I, I, Isle of Man's famously a tax haven, I think, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's uh, it has the same status as like Jersey and Guernsey, who I've also been to, and they have their own notes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they are not part of the UK, but they're not a territory; they're a crown colony, so they're directly, you know, under the crown. But the UK is kind of responsible for them. So they're like this, you know, cousin that you never see, but you're still paying for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of these, um, I suppose the, the hangovers from the Empire days, aren't they? When uh, Britain had an empire and we had these foreign... Yeah, I actually just did a podcast on it uh, where I went through all the, uh, the imperial leftovers, like the crumbs that are, that are still there that are too small to become independent. <laughs> <laughs> and they also tend to be the most expensive ones you had to pay for. <laughs> That's a good point. You should tell us about the podcast because obviously you're on a podcast and people might listen. Uh, yeah. So if you, if you go to listen, listen to most travel podcasts, it's all about, you know, go, go to this place or it's about hotels and flights or frequent flyer programs. And that's great, but that's not why we fly. You know, with, with all the restriction on travel recently, like there's been articles I've seen where this company is offering you, oh, you can go get a flight experience. And basically they have this thing where you sit in a chair, like on an airplane for several hours and then they feed you food like on an airplane. I'm like, this is the dumbest thing in the world. Yeah. All you got to do is get an uncomfortable chair, put it in a closet and eat a TV dinner. And that's flying. You don't yeah. need to, to pay money for this. <laughs> to me, travel has always been learning about new stuff, going to, to places and, you know, learning about their history, learning about how they operate. And so the podcast was, um, I couldn't travel. And I had this idea in the back of my head. So what I did is I launched a daily podcast. It's a daily scripted show. The episodes are pretty short. And I talk about all sorts of different stuff. Uh, much of it I learned on my travels. So the show I just finished recording uh, a few hours ago was talking about the common origins of rugby, association football, and American football. And by extension, Australian football, Gaelic football, uh, and everything else, how there really is this common proto sport that existed prior to codifying rules in the 19th century that they all actually originate from. And association football said, you can't carry the ball. And then, you know, rugby said, no, you can carry the ball. And then they tried playing rugby in the U S and they're like, no, 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 we're going to do our own rules to it. And then that became American football. And then the Australians kind of, they were, 
on the other end of the world. So they didn't know what the hell was going on. So they made their own sport. And then the Irish were like, we don't want to do what the English do. So they made their own sport, <laughs> but it all had this, 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 you know, proto sport. It was probably closest to rugby more than anything else, but each town may have even had their own version of football that basically consisted of, there was a ball, here's a goal, get the ball in the goal and this other team will stop you. And, you know, the early, we don't have, there were no real reports of what the rules were other than the fact of people commenting that this early game was really violent. Which is probably, <laughs> it's more like rugby. Yeah. <laughs> I read somewhere once that um, the, the ancient Mayan civilization had some sort of form of football, but they used to play with people's heads. Uh, it was more like a basketball, actually. You can go to certain uh, Mayan ruins. So I remember seeing it in Copan, and I think they have a place in, not Tulum, maybe it's in Coba, which is in the Yucatan Peninsula. And it was a like a type of court, and they had a stone ring. Mm. And yeah, you would have to get the ball through the ring. And the ring wasn't horizontal like a basketball hoop. It was like vertical. And uh, supposedly, yeah, the, the losing team would get killed or it. something. The losing team, that was it, yeah. Yeah, big and Talk about team. relegation. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> Talk about high stakes. Cracky. Mm. I was just going to ask you as well, Gary, just going back to sort of right at the beginning when you were talking about your, running your business. Um, do you notice now, do you feel, I suppose, are you less stressed traveling around the world, doing your podcast, doing all this kind of thing, your photography, as compared to running your business and things like that? No, the last three months have been horrible. Um, <laughs> you know, the travel industry has basically evaporated. Mm. Something I never, ever would have thought would have happened. You know, travel is, and tourism is one of the largest industries in the world. I think a lot of people aren't aware of that, that, um, you know, it's on a par with things like energy and agriculture. That's how big it is. Oh. And people buying travel and people selling travel have both disappeared. So like my income disappeared, like 98% of it just gone. Mm -hmm. um, and as I mentioned before the show started, I lived in Minneapolis, which yeah. I'm guessing most of you have never even maybe heard of. Um, most people in the world, you know, if, if you heard of it, it's because Prince was from there. Yeah. Um, Cold. And I lived one block off Lake Street which is where everything was happening. Right. And, you know, I was, I was going out of my house every day and, you know, oh, well, that burned down. That's, mm. you know, everything here was destroyed. Uh, so between those two things happening, yeah, the last couple of months have really sucked. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, the podcast has been something that, that I've been able to focus on and that's been fun. And it's gotten a lot of, a really good reaction so far, uh, you know, from people that just want to, they want to learn stuff. And, and the whole point of the show is that it's really random, that you're going to have completely different episodes about stuff every single day. Um, I just did the, the episode before that was about a woman who just died in May, and she was the last person to receive a pension from the U.S. Civil War. Oh, yeah. Oh, which wow. it was over like 160 years ago. And what happened is her father had her in 1930 when he was 83 years old. <laughs> he was a civil war veteran oh she lived God. to the age of 90 and got his pension which was 73 dollars and 13 cents never ingested for inflation and she began getting that in 1938 and got it all the way through the year 2020 um and i did one show similar to that about president john tyler who was the i think the 13th u.s president was born in the year 1790 230 years ago he has two living grandchildren today Oh, wow. Yes, I've read an article. Yeah, about so you immediately start trying to do the math in yeah. your head. And basically, it was a similar deal. He had children very late in life. And then mm. his children had, he had a child that had children very late in life. And then those children are, lived to be in their 90s. Mm. Um, so, yeah, they're alive today. And their grandpa was born 230 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and that, there's another show I haven't done yet, but there's a woman in Romania who was a grandmother at the age of 23. <laughs> that's the other end of the spectrum isn't it right oh god i think the, uh, the oldest man on the planet died this week i think was it was it yeah unfortunately that's always happening <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> i mean 
I don't know if they do it there, but like a lot of the radio station, the morning shows, uh, they always do a thing called the Deadpool every year. <laughs> yeah. Where it's like a draft and you pick people who you think are going to die. <laughs> and you get more points the younger they are. Oh. So if you pick like, you know, the oldest man in the world, that, that's not going to get you a lot of <laughs> points. And then so it's like a fantasy football type thing, but for people dying. And, <laughs> I'm the oldest man in the world to get you that many points. <laughs> you're obviously very much into your history, and um, I was listening to the, your English Longbow podcast um, the other day. So I, I think it's definitely people who like history. It's the, the little bite sized, you know, 10, 15 minute episodes, and you're going to learn something, and that's valuable f to people. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's you know, uh, the Longbow is really hard to, to master, which is why most countries in Europe never bothered with it. But because England was an island, uh, you know, a lot of the kings basically just dictated, okay, everyone's going to learn how to shoot the bow. And they had this enormous population of people that they could draw from um, to create standing armies. And in the Hundred Year War, up until the invention of cannons, it worked great that they could just, you know, get a whole bunch of unskilled people where well, they were skilled insofar as they could shoot a bow and then just launch arrows at the French and wipe them out by the bushel. And... Um, you know, they had a period of time where, where, they, were, where they were just kicking ass uh, with the longbow. Yeah, and a like lot of English mercenaries were hired all over Europe because of that. Right, really. Well, mm -hmm. it's similar to the the horse archers of the steppe, you know, the Mongols and the, all the precursors and subsequent uh, steppe peoples. You know, they were they were the archers, and, and again, they were hired out as mercenaries from ancient times again right pretty much up until the invention of gunpowder it took before they could be subdued i did an uh, an episode on the stirrup which i said was the greatest simplest invention ever so like the, the ancient romans never had stirrups yeah. and if you think about it it's a super easy thing um but they never had it but it was the stirrup that allowed people to shoot from a bow and also allowed for heavy mounted cavalry but yeah when the when you had light um cavalry like that they just slaughtered anyone that they came across. And I have a future episode I'm going to do about the horse in North America, how a lot of people don't realize that you think of American Indians on horseback, but they didn't have horses. The horses came from the Spanish, actually. And the, one of the greatest light cavalry civilizations ever were the Comanche Indians, who went from never having seen a horse in a few generations to being the greatest light cavalry in the world. And it's not like they had someone from Mongolia come over to teach it to them. They figured it all out on their own. Wow. And it was incredible. Yeah, because I mean, like the Mongols, I think I think you, you were put on a horse at four years old, and you were given a bow as soon as you had the strength to draw it back. I mean, it, it's from early childhood you were sort of put in this program, and this was going to be your way of life. Yeah, I, I've done a lot of research on the Mongols, and it was fascinating. Uh, not only did they have a a warrior system like that, kind of like the Spartans, but because they were nomadic you couldn't conquer them. You couldn't just walk into their capital city because there was no capital city. Yeah. They just move. So like, what are you going to do? Yeah. The Chinese had to, they, they, they tried every tactic they could to try and keep them separate and keep them warring with each other. Because the, the one thing they really feared was someone like Genghis Khan coming and uniting all the tribes. And then that was, that was uh, curtains for them then pretty much, wasn't it? Yeah, he has a remarkable story. I mean, if there's anyone in the world that went from a true low, like where he literally had nothing and was hiding in a ditch with his mom, to the ultimate high of controlling most, you know, the biggest empire, you know, the world at the time, it's Genghis Khan. Um, I have a couple of potential episodes in the future, one of which is his grave, and no one knows where it is. Man. It was one of those things where they, they buried his body in a secret spot, and then all the people that buried him, they killed. Yep. So they couldn't tell it, and then... What, what do you think was the reasoning for that? Because if you think of other, like, you can, I think you can still go to Cyrus the Great's grave and various other conquerors. What, do you know why they, they kept it hidden, Genghis Khan? A Mongol thing, I think, uh, that you just didn't know where someone was buried, so it's hidden. Um, like a yeah, protection? It, 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 there's not a big monument or anything. It was just a tomb that they created and they buried. Yeah, yeah just a cultural thing, I guess, maybe yeah. a superstition. So. Uh, we love our history on this podcast. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you was, you know, you've been, you've obviously been to loads of amazing ancient sites and, and whatnot. What, what have been some of the sort of man-made constructions that have really blown you away? 
Okay, there's one in Wales that I really love, and I can't pronounce it because it's Welsh. Um, <laughs> it's Neither the can we. Ponskathaith <laughs> Aqueduct. It's like an aqueduct that's 200 feet it, that, that goes over this valley floor that was designed for barges. And it was built in the, the 18th century, and it's, it's really cool. And today you can, you know, rent a kayak and paddle over it and look down on the land while you're in a boat. Oh. Um, it was considered one of the wonders of the world at the time, and, and for good reason. Uh, a lot of the historical buildings, I'm doing a series of those, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, fascinating building, not very beautiful, you know, if, if you consider cathedrals in Europe, but, you know, it's split between five different churches, and they get in fights all the time, and they can never agree on anything, so the whole place is kind of a shithole that they've let fall apart over the centuries, and what a lot of people don't know is that, you know, I, ostensibly it's the most holy site in Christendom. Uh, the keys to the building are actually have been held by a Muslim family for a thousand years because they, the Christians can't agree amongst themselves who would get the keys. So <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. the Hagia Sophia in, in Istanbul, I think is a really interesting building. A lot of skyscrapers and stuff too. I've always been kind of interested and fascinated by uh, you're going to, there's some outside of the U S I think the, the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, uh, you know, I've always been fascinated by, by big buildings. And there was always this debate. It's like, well, you know, this is the biggest building, but this is a little bit bigger because there's a spire on it. And then there's this radio tower, which is a little bit bigger. And then the Burj Khalifa just wiped all those records away. Cause it's the biggest anything in any category, no matter what. Wow. Really? Mm. Have you, um, have you ever been to Baalbek in Lebanon? I have not. Uh, I just haven't gotten there. I've been just over the border in Israel and stuff, but uh, Baalbek is one of the places I want to go. Leptis Magna in Libya. It's really one of the best preserved Roman ruins that you can visit because um, it's in the desert. Uh, Jerash in Jordan is another uh, great one that's a was a Roman city uh, that was established. Right, because most people just think of Petra, don't they, and probably don't visit anywhere else. I've never heard of that place before. Oh, yeah. Jerash is, is really cool. There's a lot of great stuff in Jordan, and it's all pretty easy to visit because it's a pretty small country. Um, Wadi Rum is another great one. Uh, if you've ever seen Lawrence of Arabia, uh, it was shot in Wadi Rum. And the new Dune movie that's coming out, <laughs> which the trailer should be dropping soon, that was all the, the Raqqa scenes were shot in Wadi Rum as well. Um, and I actually got to spend a couple nights out in the desert in a Bedouin camp and uh, fantastic experience. Absolutely great. Um, I suppose uh, the problem with a lot of these like uh, really ancient sites in the Near East is, is it, it can be so volatile in a lot of these countries. It's not as bad as you think. Um, one of the problems we have is we only hear bad news when we hear about a place at all. And the example I always give is, you know, when I ask people what comes up when you think of Colombia, the country of Colombia, <laughs> everyone always says drug lords. <laughs> that was yeah. in the eighties. You know, that's in a long time. The problem is nothing has replaced that image. It's not like there was a story on the news that says, by the way, Colombia is great now, problem <laughs> solved. You know, this is Colombia. That that's not how it works. So like Jordan has never had uh huge amounts of terrorists. They've never had a civil war. Uh, it's a solid middle-class Middle Eastern country. It's not dysfunctional. It's not super rich like you're going to have in the Gulf states, like in, in the UAE or Qatar or any place like that. And it has a lot of these great historical attractions. And uh, there, the, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that I think, you know, Petra does get a lot of the attention and a lot of the visitors to Petra are actually doing day trips over the border from Israel. Uh, but I think it's worthwhile uh, just going to Jordan on its own. I think the Jordanian side of the Dead Sea is better than the Israeli side. Um, and the Dead Sea is a great place to go be next to. Floating in the Dead Sea sucks ass. <laughs> Don't do it. If you have the slightest nick or cut or anything mm. on your body, you are going to be in horrible pain. And awkwardly floating is something which is interesting for about 30 seconds. And then you're like, because you, you can't swim. <laughs> I mean, you could swim, but if any of that water gets in your mouth or in your eyes, it's horrible. I was on the shore of the Dead Sea, and I saw this salt-encrusted rock. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. So I bent down to pick it up and it slipped out of my hand. 
and the water splashed up and a drop of water hit me in the eye and I couldn't see out of my eye for like five minutes because it was so salty. <laughs> but being down there is cool because there's actually like 10% more oxygen and a lot of the UV rays don't penetrate that far down. So it's a great place to like uh, just kind of be outside and, and to be that, you know, far below sea level. Oh, yeah, yeah that's, the, that's the reason why it's um, full of salt, isn't it? Because it's so far below sea level. Yeah, it's, well, it's evaporating, yeah. And it's evaporating quickly. It's dropping like a meter a year, I think, uh, or more. Um, yeah, I, I did an episode of my podcast about this uh, idea called Atlantropa, with it, which this German engineer had. What he wanted to do was basically turn the Mediterranean into the Dead Sea and create an enormous dam at the Strait of Gibraltar, which would power all of Europe and then let the sea level drop by 100 meters and then build a second one between Sicily and Tunisia and let the, the eastern half drop another 100 meters. Crazy plan. Absolutely <laughs> bonkers. But uh, <coughs> really interesting that they would... If you've ever seen the, net, uh, the Amazon series, The Man in the High Castle, which is yeah, this yeah. alt history of, you know, if the Nazis won the war, in the background of one of their shots of the map of the world, they have that the Nazis built this. <laughs> so. And that's where the, was it a, a Nazi who came up with this idea? He was a German. And I think he sucked <laughs> up to thing, the Nazis. Same thing, that, isn't it? <laughs> uh, there, there were a lot of Germans that weren't Nazis. <laughs> oh, I think it okay. was one of those deals where he may have joined the party to, to try to get his idea uh, adopted or something. Mm. Right, so cracky, that's ambitious for that period of time, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I mean... Mm -hmm. You got to hand it to him in balls and nothing else, you know, I'm going to dam up the Mediterranean. And the thing is with a dam, you're usually damming a river, right? Yeah, and so yeah. the, the water flows downhill. Well, mm. with the Mediterranean, it's already at sea level. So it's not like you're damming, you know, you have one, each yeah. side is going to be the exact same level of water. It's required by the fact that the Mediterranean evaporates a lot of water. And several million years ago, it actually did evaporate. Uh, which is why there are these enormous salt deposits around there. And basically, when, when geologists discovered this, that's where the idea for this project was born, was just recreating it. Right. Well, when did it? Right. How long ago? I want to say it was like maybe f five million years ago. All right. So before, um, before he made this enormous event. You know, the sea levels were a lot lower than they used to be. Um, I think like 100 feet less, uh, maybe 10,000 years ago. 400 feet less this is um before before the younger dryas isn't it um, yeah um there was a, a a tsunami that occurred in southern or in southern india and when a tsunami occurs the water first goes out and a lot of the the seafloor is exposed and evidently people saw structures there that they that they otherwise had never seen before before the water came in and killed everyone um yeah, this is um, a, a budding new field of archaeology, isn't it? Um, going into sh uh, sort of just off coast, um, they're finding stuff all over the place. Um, Gunung Padang, is it, in Indonesia, I want to say? Well, yeah, I mean, if you, are you familiar with Graham Hancock? Uh, yeah. So, I, a lot of his particular ideas, I don't know if I, I buy, but I certainly buy his big picture idea, which is that civilization is older than we think by several thousand years. And like Gobekli Tempe in, in, in Turkey and these places are showing that it's true. And the only reason we ever thought it was like 6,000 years old is because that's the oldest stuff we found. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, but when you realize that the sea levels were lower and that most human beings live near the sea, when they rose, it's natural to assume that a lot of these places were destroyed. And it also makes, it explains the story of the flood, which is the one story which seems to exist in almost every culture. Yeah, this is something we've we've heard from several guests now, isn't it? Yeah. About the u ubiquitousness. Is that even a word? Ubiquitousness? Yeah. Of, it is now. Yeah, of the flood. Yeah. You know. Ubiquity. Ubiquity. That's that's more eloquent. Thank you, Matthew. No problem. Yeah, the flood <laughs> yeah. Whether whether you're talking about um not Enki, what's it called? Um the Sumerian one. Gilgamesh. Epic of Gilgamesh. Or, you know, there's Noah's flood or, or what have you. In fact, um, was it George? We're talking to George Howard, weren't he? And, and, and he was talking about they could have found the um, biblical Sodom 
uh, somewhere in the Holy Land, near Jericho, I think. And um, like the thing, I love the thing uh, Graham Hancock says. He says stuff just keeps getting older. And uh, like well, you said, well, you mentioned Gebekli Tepe. That seems to be pretty much the oldest thing we've found as far as civilization goes. As far as like, you know, yeah, large structures. Um, yeah. In the Americas, you know, the, the idea was, well, humans came here about 20,000 years ago, roughly when the, the Bering Land Bridge. And we keep finding stuff that's older, <laughs> which is, you know, leading people to believe that there may have been multiple incursions of humans into this area. Um, but yeah, it's all dependent upon, and it's it's been tough to to get ac academics to accept this because you know once you accept this certain model, it becomes very difficult for people to go against that grain before they're you know they're ridiculed professionally. But I think the evidence is getting to a point where people now have to accept that it's older than that. Well, I think Graham Hancock in his his last book, America Before, said that a lot of the archaeologists they never in America in North America. They never even bothered digging down below a certain level because they assume that there's nothing to find. And that's part of this academic bias is probably the wrong word, but, um, you know, the, the, uh, you know, you, you go to school and you, and you taught certain things and these things are held to be true. And it takes courage to go against that training and question it and, and stick your neck out, doesn't it? Before I started traveling, I actually went back to school. So I was in my 30s. And uh, I went back and I studied geology and geophysics for a couple of years. And the classic example in that was the theory of uh, continental drift. So continental, well, which continental drift, by the way, was proven to be wrong, but it, was, it had the right idea that the continents were moving. And the original idea was that it was floating on top of this other layer of like oceanic crust, which was not true. But plate tectonics, the theory that, you know, eventually replaced it, which was true, uh, it had a lot of resistance for a long time because one of the, the central tenets in geology is that things change slowly, right? Gradualism. Yeah. And that, that idea that, you know, uh, this also has to do, uh, for, uh, what's, what's the guy's name? Randall? Carlson. Yeah, he's talking about the scab lands in eastern Washington state and how this was created through a, a cataclysm. And, and for the most part, things in geology do move slow, but that doesn't mean that occasionally something big can't happen. You know, there's a volcanic eruption. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been to Washington State, but where like Mount St. Helens was, that completely changed overnight. You know, one day the mountain erupted and then these valleys were filled with mud and everything was destroyed. So it certainly can happen. And uh, this idea of this, um, you know, glacial lake that burst somewhere over Canada I think there's a lot more evidence, you know, people are coming around to that idea as well now. Yeah, is it the Missoula floods, is it called? Uh, yeah, it could be. If that's, Missoula is in Montana, so. Oh, right. It's kind of, they usually name that stuff after a region, so I think the, the ice caps would have come down that far. So maybe that was like where it broke or something. Yeah, because I think the prevailing theory was that there was sort of ice dams holding back this water, and then um, they call it meltwater pulls a and melt water pulls b or something and and that eventually these dams broke and that caused the floods whereas randall is one of these proponents of an impact on or several impacts on the ice sheets the laurentine and the the other one i can't remember and that there's a place in argentina where you can actually witness this that ha it happens every uh well i'd say maybe once a decade months every other decade there's this in los glaciares national park in El Calafate, there's this glacier that keeps advancing and it advances into this lake and then it eventually abuts this, this land. And the lake has two lobes. So when the glacier hits the land, it closes off the flow of water between the two lobes and the water on one side starts to rise causing pressure and eventually it breaks the glacier in a cataclysmic fashion. And I think it was like 1998 was the last time this happened. And they had news reports and they had their cameras there and they were covering this live, waiting for the ice to break. And it eventually wow. did and they, they were able to record it. Um, but yeah, it was basically that on a massive scale. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, I mean, all of Canada, I think, and, and a lot, a big chunk of North America was covered in, in ice 12,000 years ago. Oh, the place I, I live right now in Wisconsin, 
there's a whole area here called the Moraine District, which was the terminal point of the Ice Age. And we have a trail that goes through the state. It's about a thousand miles long because it's really windy. That's called the Ice Age Trail. And it basically follows the terminal point of the Ice Age through the state. Wow. So you know, I love these theories about ancient civilizations. And like you were talking about, maybe there was multiple where, uh, passages of ingress into the United States, maybe by boat, maybe to the south. And, you know, because everyone seems to think it, it was the Bering Land Bridge where people migrated. And there's just so many mysteries, and that's what makes it so interesting, isn't it? And we well, don't uh, if, you ever, if you ever want to visit a cool place, Leonxa Meadow is at the northernmost tip of the island of Newfoundland in, in Canada. And we know for certain that a thousand years ago, Vikings made it to Newfoundland and they established a colony there. We found the evidence, uh, you know, we found, and one of the, I, I don't know if it's true or if it's just a good story. When the Vikings first came there, they had the settlement. I think it lasted a couple decades before it collapsed. They would trade with the local uh, Indians. And at one point they traded with them some cheese. Now, the Native Americans never really ate dairy products. So they didn't have the ability to uh, digest lactose properly. And so they got real sick when they ate the cheese and they thought that they were being poisoned by the Europeans. And so that actually started a conflict with them. And I heard was one of the reasons that the colony eventually didn't work was due to lactose intolerance. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it depends what you're adapted to, doesn't it, you see? I mean, it, since sort of the dawn of agriculture, that's when we've started this sort of long process of, of adaptation. I mean, so if you're going back, you know, 12, 15,000 years ago, there was people didn't eat bread or grains, or it was, it was pretty much just meat, wasn't it, I presume? Oh, yeah. This is something I could talk about a lot. Uh, if you go to look at ancient Egyptian, both the mummies and some of the statues, one of the things you'll find is that they were fat. And <clears throat> like, if you look at um, a good example is they, some of the film, they had the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 mission. And they had all these old films of people there to watch the launch and everybody was skinny, right? And now everyone's kind of fat. And the question is, well, well, what happened, right? And it's not just that people are eating more, it's that the diet has fundamentally changed over the last 50 years and there's a lot more sugar refined uh, grains and seed oils. And that was almost non-existent, you know, from the human diet. Well, seed oils didn't even exist. Uh, people ate very little sugar. I think uh, around the year 1900, the average American had like five pounds of sugar a year. And now that's close to like 145 pounds a year. Wow. So it's increased dramatically. Things like seed oils and uh, that type of uh, polyunsaturated fat did not exist, right? We, we only had animal fats that we would have eaten. Um, whereas, and the reason I bring up the Egyptians is because they uniquely among the civilizations had a diet that was very high in grains. And so you had these kind of flabby uh, Egyptians and like King Tut and a lot of these other mummies had a lot more fat on them than they found in other peoples, uh, like some of the ice people they find in glaciers in Europe and stuff like that. That's interesting, yeah. I mean, I heard one, I don't know if it's true, but I heard that a lot, a lot of things changed in the 1970s when there was this sort of war on fat and that fat's no good for you and cholesterol and all the Absolutely. rest. Absolutely, yeah. And I've actually lost, uh, I gained a lot of weight traveling and I lost 60 pounds. I don't know what that is. That's like one stone. I, <laughs> I don't know what the conversion, but um, basically I just, I just ate meat for like three months and I just lost a ton of weight. And I had a lot of just, you know, nagging little things, aches and pains that just all went away. Well, there is, there is, people talk about carbohydrates uh, contributing to inflammation, don't they? Yeah. And, you know, I, I, you know, but prior to, you know, modern food, processed food, you know, people ate bread and potatoes. I don't think it's, it's, you know, putting it in your mouth is necessarily going to be harmful, but we weren't eating this refined stuff. And that's the difference. Like, you know, you, if you live in the Andes, you can chew a cocoa leaf, no problem. People do that all the time. It's when you refine it into cocaine or into crack that it becomes a problem. And literally what we're doing with wheat is refining it to a point and with sugar, you know, to a point where it's, we're just 
getting that refined dietary equivalent of cocaine. Yeah. I, I heard um, a couple of things about the post-war period in this country. Um, I heard a rumor that people were healthier in the early 50s when rationing was still a thing. And also that uh, white bread was banned in this country for a short period. Because again, you, like we're talking about the processing procedure, things were processed so heavily that there was, there was virtually no nutritional value in it. And that's when they had to start adding things and it's like, oh, now with riboflavin and it's stuff they're having to put back in because they right. stripped yeah. it of all its nutritional value. Yeah. If you just eat normal whole foods, you, you don't really need a lot of supplements. Uh, there's a good argument to be made that agriculture itself made people less healthy. Uh, what it did do was allow for a consistent supply of calories. So it decreased the problems of starvation. You know, that was always the problem if you're a hunter-gatherer. It's just like, well, what if, what if you go out and there's, you don't get anything? Well, then you starve and you die. Yeah. So agriculture kind of solved that problem, especially because there was a, a, a pretty big extinction event around the world of uh, large megafauna, large mammals that died off because we probably killed them all. Uh, large oryxes in, in Europe, um, Mammoths, you know, in a lot of uh, Asia and North America, they died out. They were probably hunted to extinction, which led to the necessity of agriculture, which created a more even supply of calories, but probably decreased the, the nutritional value. And we start to see things like tooth decay, more heart disease, and things like that, because we were eating a diet which were able, you know, had some benefits. You know, we got a thing called civilization out of it, but from an individual health standpoint, was probably not the best. No, it was a trade-off, wasn't it? Because you, you right. gain the ability to be able to store calories long-term in grain stores and whatnot, and that gives you then labor and free time to be able exactly. to have specialists. You know, I'm going to be a stonemason or a tailor or whatever, or a trader, which just would not be an option without having that luxury of having food in storage. So it's a trade-off, really, and... I mean, I think we, it's a, a fair price to pay considering where we're at now, I guess. Well, now we can actually figure out what is the proper diet. We have things like, you know, refrigeration. So yeah. you could store meat in a way that you never could before. Uh, this also goes back to the topic of Golbeki Tempe. And one of the things is, well, how did, you know, these hunter-gatherers or these nomadic people manage to build these large structures? Because it makes sense if you're, you know, in a agricultural civilization how did they do it if they were nomadic one of the theories i heard is that they did it basically you know they would come to this place in the summer and you know when things were relatively abundant and they would build this and it, it occurred over a period of maybe you know many many years it wasn't just something that was had they had a dedicated workforce for i mean the the, the issue i would have with that is because is i'm pretty sure there are astronomical alignments at gebekli tepe and and if that's correct then that presupposes that they were an agricultural society because why, why else would you bother with, with astronomical um, observations if it's not for agriculture? Agriculture didn't necessarily have to be a, a binary thing. So I'm sure the first agriculture was, you know, you're at a hunting camp and you throw some seeds on the ground and the next year you come back to the same camp. It's like, oh, that plant is there now. And they kind of figured it out. So it, it, it might have been a type of we plant something, we leave and we come back and we harvest it. So it wasn't a, you know, you have to plow the fields every day and stuff like that. So I'm guessing that was kind of how it originated. So we, it wasn't, you know, it's something we, we did over a period of centuries or millennia. So there probably would have still been good reasons for tracking the stars. And I'm sure people did it well before that, just because what else was there to do at night? You know, they <laughs> you know when is the hunt? When is the migration going to happen? Uh, being able to plan those sort of things. Well, oh, the star is at this level. We need to start moving over to our hunting grounds now. So we're there in time. Uh, yeah. So I think there still would have been reasons. Yeah, it's sort of seeing the dawn of agriculture is not a, 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 an immediate change, but a gradual process that maybe took thousands of years. And I, that, don't, that just makes sense to me, right? Yeah. Um, that unless, you, unless an ancient civilization came and gave you all the, uh, the knowledge overnight. 
Yeah, that I'm not too big of a, a fan of. Uh, you know, extraordinary claims need extraordinary evidence. And I think a bunch of uh, drawings on rock that look like a guy with a handbag is not really <laughs> the most convincing argument. I think there's going to need to be more than that. Oh, we need to we need to get you talking to Ryan Seven about the handbag, don't we? Oh. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. So, oh yeah, yeah we. we... <laughs> Ryan Seven, who came on, well, it was before the lockdown, wasn't it? Several yeah. months ago, but oh, okay. he pretty much talked for an hour about the handbag. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he, he had an article published on Graham Hancock's site about the, uh, his handbag theory. He's got mm. to put it out soon. I mean, it's interesting, but yeah. it's a bag, right? <laughs> I mean, I don't, I, the, like I said, it's interesting, but I don't think that it, it proves the existence of a civilization. Or, you know, the other thing is like, oh, we saw this Egyptian hieroglyph and it looks like a guy in a space capsule from the <laughs> 1960s. Therefore, they had space capsules. Yeah. And to me, you know, strangely enough, the space capsule was, you know, just the 1960s. It wasn't a space shuttle. It was that version. And it's like L. Ron Hubbard saying, oh, the, the aliens, you know, their, their spacecraft look just like DC-8s, which happened to be the spacecraft at the time he wrote it in the 1950s. Not a Concorde, not a 747, but a DC-8. Um, <laughs> coincidentally enough, so, no, yeah, that, that's kind of where they lose me. I think you're right when you say extraordinary claims need extraordinary evidence. I think that's a good uh, mantra to uh, live by. <laughs> So, you know, I can't say it's not true, No, but I, I, I just, you need more to convince me. More data is required. Right. Now, if they find one of these bags and there's like some <laughs> stuff in it, okay, then we got that. That's a different story. Like a, like a Tamagotchi and uh, <laughs> a Rubik's Cube or something. Yeah, it's like a book. It's like your very first farm. And then it just tells you <laughs> what to do. To grow this stuff, it's like how to build a pyramid. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, don't get us started on the pyramids. <laughs> I presume. What's what's um, your favorite place in Egypt to visit? Um, Luxor is a really great. You know the stuff around Luxor. There's so much stuff around there. Um, I went down, and also I went down to uh, Ebu Simbel, which is you're getting pretty close to Sudan at that point, which I'd actually, I haven't been to Sudan, but I really want to go visit some of the pyramids because, you know, it doesn't just end at the Egyptian border. It actually just keeps going into there. Um, some really cool stuff in Ethiopia as well that I got to visit. Uh, Axum, that, uh, <clears throat> I, 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 I read, that was the first Grant Hancock book I read about the, the Ark of the Covenant. The sign and the seal. Yeah. Which actually, later I found out, someone actually did sneak their way into the... Uh, <laughs> covenant building in ethiopia and the guy said it was just a replica i think this was like in the, the 40s or something that happened so yeah. <clears throat> yeah it's the famous story of the blind priest isn't it who uh, supposedly guard the ark of the covenant but... um actually the the coolest thing now that i think about it, the coolest thing in egypt that i got to see was i did a dive off of uh the the pier in alexandria and you can see the ruins of the lighthouse of alexandria that are still underwater Wow. And not a lot of people are aware of this. Yeah. And it's a, it's a really interesting, probably the only archaeological dive that I've done. Um, wow. You didn't find any old scrolls or anything with the, <laughs> with the unit? No, but there were, I, there were a few like Sphinx statues uh, that were buried, but mostly it's just big blocks. And a lot <laughs> of the blocks were used for a, a fort that's currently on the site of it, uh, Fort Katabe. Um, yeah, that's the, that's the common theme, isn't it? Things get reused, and and like if you mm. say you were in Jerusalem, you'll uh, or Cairo, there'll be bits of of old Egyptian ancient stone that's been reused in in the city. Oh, you'll see that all over, including in Europe. Uh, if you ever go to the t uh, to Pisa in Italy, mm. ignore the Leaning Tower. That's not the important part. Go to the cathedral itself, and you'll see all these blocks with like bits of Arabic writing and stuff on it that are like, you know, sideways and things like that because they use parts of another building to, to create the cathedral. And yeah, you see that all over. <clears throat> the, the marble that used to clad the Colosseum in Rome, most of that is now in St. Peter's Basilica. Wow. Because they just used it as a, as a quarry because they had all this marble sitting there. 
And that's why it looks so naked today. Cracky. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, we're, we're rocking up to an hour already. I can't believe how yeah. it's gone. But um, thanks for coming, Gary. Is there anything you need to you need to add? I mean, we'll we'll be posting the links and everything on the show notes. But where do where do we need to send people? Uh, just you know, search for the podcast. Just search for everything everywhere daily. Um, that's where they can find me. And uh, yeah, thanks. I mean, I didn't expect to be on the show because no one expects the Amish Inquisition. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's been great. It's been really great to have you. Yeah, thanks for coming. It's been great and informative as usual. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, if you ever have, want to have me back, just let me know. Oh, that's great. Thanks a lot. Lots of lots of stuff I we never even touched on that I've talked no. about. Oh yeah. yeah, sure, definitely. I want to ask you about the carnivore diet, but that's gonna to have to wait. <laughs> Pretty easy. Like, <laughs> <laughs> eat meat. <laughs> it's Actually, be- the only thing to toss in is, you know, make sure it's high fat, uh, toss in some organ meat like liver and stuff every so often. And then I also try to eat sardines and, and some other fish because there's some nutrients in there that you're you that may be in, in lower amounts. And if you do that, you're kind of gold. It's pretty simple. It's not like being a vegan. <laughs> um, where you got to do it right and you're still going to get sick in three years. <laughs> well, if you do it right, you really don't need any supplements. You don't need any, you know, anything. No. <clears throat> well, it's been brilliant. Thanks for coming, Gary. Mm-hmm. Thank um, you. Stick around while we play ourselves out. And yeah. we'll be back in a minute. Don't forget to check the website and the podcast out. Okay. See you in a bit, eavesdroppers. Two minutes. Cheers. <laughs> Yeah.